Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us here at the Maya Mural Hall. On behalf of all the speakers tonight, I acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we stand. I also pay respect to the elders of the Kulin Nation, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians who join us here tonight. The Mural Hall has a special place in Melbourne's history, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to it tonight. Some of you might know it was once the original venue for dining and special occasions, created by Sydney Meyer in the 1930s. The Meyer family itself had an early connection to the development of Australian aviation, with Norman Meyer's joy flights over Melbourne to Sydney Meyer's financial stake in the history-making flight of the Southern Cross across the Pacific in 1928. So it's an appropriate venue to bring people together from across the aviation and the airport community for tonight's event. It's an opportunity to connect our past to our present and, of course, our shared future ahead. Soon, you'll hear from our chairman and chief executive. But this year, we've expanded the cast to introduce the leaders of our key business units. And tonight, they'll share with you some insights into their future plans for our business. But first, to begin, allow me to introduce our chairman, Mr. David Crawford. Thanks very much, Carly, and uh, good evening to everyone here tonight. And thank you for joining us at our stakeholder update. This event is a valuable opportunity for us to report to you on what we have achieved during the past year and provide some insight into our current priorities and future plans. I am pleased to report that it has been another successful year for Melbourne Airport and its stakeholders. Since APAC first acquired the lease for Melbourne Airport more than 15 years ago, traveller numbers have increased by more than 20 million, and this is a trend we anticipate will continue into the future. This growth in passengers has been supported by billions of dollars of privately funded investment in capital expenditure. During the last four years alone, investors have been pleased to support more than $2 billion in new and upgraded infrastructure, laying the foundations for generation of airport users to come. At a time when the public sector is challenged in meeting all of the demands on it for new infrastructure spending, our private investment delivers significant dividends for the Victorian and national economy. Our investment decisions are carefully guided by the requirements of our customers to ensure they support the growth of their businesses now and into the future. The new Terminal 4 domestic terminal is a good example of how airport operators work with their customers to achieve the best outcome when planning and delivering new investments. Since it became fully operational in November last year, millions of domestic passengers have used the new terminal. We work carefully to balance the requirements of our airline customers for new facilities and better services now and in the medium term with our responsibility to deliver sustainable returns for our investors over the longer term. It is perhaps not widely understood that our investors are responsible for managing the superannuation and pension funds for millions of Australians. This year, we will pay a $158 million dividend to our investors. And this is a significant contribution to the retirement incomes of current and future generations of Australians. I believe we are getting the balance right. Our airport operates safely, efficiently, and successfully. And as you will hear this evening, every area of the business is growing. We fully understand our role as an important part of the state infrastructure, and this is good news for our city and our state. It means that more people are travelling to Melbourne to do business, participate in major events, further their education, or have a holiday. And of course, Victorians are travelling in ever-increasing numbers too. We're also planning for the future, including further expansion of our airside and landside facilities. 
Our success also makes it easier for Victorian businesses to trade with the rest of Australia and the world through our rapidly growing and world-class freight and handling distribution capabilities. However, we are not complacent about this success. There is more to be done to help our airline customers, retailers and many other businesses which operate at Melbourne Airport to continue in their success. We are using every opportunity we can to improve the traveller experience as they pass through our airport. We continue to look to the Commonwealth, Victorian and local governments to support our growth through policy settings that enable the airport to realise its full potential as, as it will bring to our community great success in the years to come. Our future growth will continue to depend on good planning, sensible policy and strategic investment in ground transport infrastructure and services that connect the airport to the rest of the city and state. The Board of APAC have driven significant change and improvements to ensure that we will remain fit to build on our significant achievements over the 15 years of private ownership. We are optimistic and confident of taking this airport forward in the coming years. So, in closing, and on behalf of the Board of APAC, thank you for your support and for your role in helping us to succeed together. And it is my pleasure now to introduce our CEO, Lyle Stramby, to continue our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, David, and good evening, everyone. And thank you all for making time in your very busy lives to actually be here with us tonight. Now, I've just ticked over my first anniversary of taking the role of CEO at Melbourne Airport and I couldn't think of a nicer way to mark that occasion than to spend the evening with people who really have a big stake in Melbourne Airport's success. Taking time to reflect on the achievements across that last year, but probably more importantly, and I think a lot more fun, to spend a little bit of time talking about where we're heading into the future years. Many of you will know that uh, taking up the role at Melbourne Airport was something of a homecoming for me. Uh, after several years working and living overseas and then interstate. And I did work at Melbourne Airport way, way back early in my aviation career, in short pants, I might add. And if there ever was an airport that, uh, that, that somebody like me would aspire to lead, then Melbourne was it. The airport has been a huge success since its opening in 1970. And it's almost unrecognisable today from its original form and certainly to me as well, a, a completely different airport than the one I worked at many years ago. But it's the enduring competitive advantages of Melbourne Airport is what makes it so attractive to me. Relatively close to the CBD, no curfew, and connected domestic and international terminals, and of course, plenty of room to expand our operations on a large and well-protected land bank. Best of all, it is the aviation gateway to the world's most livable city and this wonderful state with its beauty, its vibrancy and diversity. We should never underestimate the attraction our home state holds for interstate and overseas visitors. And that's why we continue to grow so rapidly. Whether they come to follow their footy team or in some cases perhaps come to see their footy team lose uh, a grand final in, uh, in a couple of days' time or to immerse themselves in one of the many major events we have here in Melbourne or to escape to the beauty of our wine and food regions, then Melbourne and Victoria's uh, wonderful attributes and make a really compelling proposition for visitors near and far. And of course, growing the interstate and international air links and the strength of the Victorian economy open up the world of travel for Victorians as well. So coming home to Melbourne has been a fantastic opportunity for me to join what is an airport that is clearly doing well, but really encouragingly, an airport that still has wonderful opportunities and plenty of potential with the support of its stakeholders to go even further. 
Now, I feel very fortunate to be in the position where we have the opportunity to make choices about the future of Melbourne Airport and to leave a legacy for the many generations to come. But make no bones about it, that's a very big responsibility that we share as a leadership team. To make sure we get this right, we're taking a new approach to the way we think about customers and what they expect from us. As part of this change, we've restructured the business to better meet the needs or align to the needs of our stakeholder community. This has seen us establish four core business units, aviation, retail, parking and ground transport, and property. And you'll be hearing from the leaders of each of those business units shortly as they provide an insight into their priorities and their plans for, for the year ahead. At the heart of this approach is the understanding that our sustainability as a business will be driven by getting a balance of stakeholder interests right. We know that in order for us to be successful, then our airline customers and other customers who run their businesses at our airport need to be successful too. We know that delivering great travel experiences to travellers helps create a memorable first and last impression of this great state. And of course, that encourages them to return and hopefully bring their friends. We also know that without support of governments and the wider community, we wouldn't continue to have their trust and their freedom to respond to the growth that we see in Victoria and at our airport. And we certainly couldn't achieve what we do without the support of our shareholders too. Clearly, as David said, they have an eye on the, both the short-term returns for their investors but also a big focus on how we build the asset value over time. And ultimately, and of course, uh, any of this success is not possible without a great team of people to deliver it. And we know really clearly that to achieve all of these things, we have to have a very high performance team who enjoy giving their best day after day after day. Delivery for all stakeholders drives our decision making and future direction. Our strategies are all about getting that balance right. I'll come back to the strategies that we've developed to achieve that balance in a moment. But as we turn to look at the achievements of the last year, I really must start with paying respect to the great work uh, of my predecessor, Chris Woodruff and his team. Because it's on the foundation of that work that we've been able to achieve these results that we've delivered this year. And as David said, it really has been a good year for Melbourne Airport. We've kept growing and the total number of passengers have increased by 5% to reach just shy of 34 million. We could have ticked it over but we missed it just a, by a tiny, tiny margin. And while international capacity to Victoria has grown by a very healthy 7%, the growth in the actual international passenger numbers has been 9.5%. That saw more than nine million international passengers pass through our door this year. It's a phenomenal number. That growth in international passengers was supported by two new international airlines coming to Melbourne, and along with additional capacity and routes from existing carriers, always important to us. We're really proud to say that Victoria's share of Australia's international passenger market is now more than 25% and Melbourne once again outperformed Sydney and Brisbane in international passenger growth, continuing the trend that we've seen for quite a few years now. It'll be no surprise to you that the China market grew strongly this year with a 21% increase. This was achieved largely by extra capacity from the established Chinese carriers, such as Air China, China Eastern and China Southern, along with some new services provided by Sichuan Airlines and China Airlines. The arrival of Scoot contributed to a 31% increase from the Singapore market this year. And of course, the Middle Eastern carriers continued to grow too. Emirates celebrating its 20th year of service to Melbourne, and Etihad made a significant investment in capacity this year by upgrading its 777 service to Abu Dhabi to a larger A380 aircraft. The United States market also achieved double digit growth this year, and it was for the second consecutive year, achieving an 11% increase in passengers, and that was largely driven by growth by Qantas and United Airlines. And of course, the New Zealand market remains a key market for Melbourne, 
with passenger numbers approaching 1.4 million for the year. And that is a growth of 4.8% in what you would have to say is a relatively mature market, so a fantastic performance there. Despite a softening in the domestic market over recent years and a stable but modest economic growth outlook for the whole of Australia, Victoria's share of domestic travel continued to grow above the national average to make us the second highest major or second highest growing major domestic airport in the country. Our domestic passengers grew by 3.7% to nearly 25 million passengers, clearly an important part of our business. And these numbers were driven by consistent performance of, across all of our domestic carriers, Qantas, Virgin Australia, Jetstar, Tiger Air, and of course, Regional Express. Adding to our strong stable of domestic airlines, we also welcomed Air North, which introduced direct flights to Melbourne from Wellcamp Airport in Queensland this year. Now, passengers are an important part of the story, uh, but it's not the entire story. Exports are an important and growing part of the Victorian economy too, partic particularly those low volume, high value, perishable goods that really do most efficiently travel by air to both interstate and overseas markets. Last year, air freight exports from Melbourne Airport increased by almost 21% to over 163,000 tonnes. It's a huge volume of freight. It is this growth, combined with the ability to send goods into international markets 24 hours a day, that has made Melbourne the leading airport export freight hub in the country. More than one third of Australia's total air freight exports left from Melbourne, and whether that was fresh produce or specialised pharmaceuticals or even international racing horses returning home after the uh, spring carnival, Melbourne's the hub of all of that activity. So when people ask me what's the biggest challenge uh, in this role and the biggest challenge facing Melbourne Airport, I actually have to think quite carefully how to answer this question and not sound smug, because our biggest challenge is the ability to make sure the airport infrastructure keeps pace with all of this growth that we're seeing. And in my mind, you know, that's a really high class problem to have and not one you should complain about too, too loudly. But I guess the real complexity for us comes from the fact that we have to deliver this capacity to meet the fantastic growth we see in a live 24-7, 365 day a year operating environment. And that is a challenge, as we've seen many occasions, requires the support of all of our stakeholders to get it right. Building the right things at the right time is critically important, and it certainly has been a really good year for infrastructure delivery at Melbourne Airport. Now, we all know domestic travellers make up more than two-thirds of passenger traffic through Melbourne, and we saw in recent years the steady growth of the domestic market probably over the last 10 years meant that airlines such as Jetstar were really starting to outgrow its accommodations in Terminal 1. And of course, Tiger Air operations in the old Terminal 4 were getting a little bit compressed as well. The delivery of the new Terminal 4, now home to Jetstar, to Tiger Air and to Regional Express, is a prime example of the role an airport plays in facilitating growth. Importantly though, for me, what it does show is what success looks like when we get the balance of our stakeholder needs right. T4 was the biggest infrastructure project undertaken at Melbourne Airport since it, since it opened in 1970. And bringing it to life while the airport continued to operate around it was no small feat. And again, I want to really um, thank uh, all of our airline customers, other people running their business, their staff of course, the taxi drivers, you name it, because there were a lot of people out there who had to put up with more than just a little bit of dust uh, while, that, uh, while that construction was, was coming together. But it was absolutely worth it. I have to tell you, I think T4 embodies a travel experience comparable with anything uh, in any domestic terminal anywhere in the world. And it certainly is one of the world's only fully self-serve terminals that includes state-of-the-art technology. And what this translates to is greater efficiency. And that enables our customer airlines to keep their fares low and, of course, really attractive to the passengers who use the facility. This great use of technology also gives time back to the traveller. And so they can actually rest and enjoy themselves in the journey. Security clearance at T4 is a breeze. The central lounging area is just a great place to spend some time before your flight. And what I think is actually quite unique, it's a wonderful reflection of Melbourne as well. 
We have a fantastic retail lineup in that terminal, uh, brands including Country Road, Witchery and Trinery, just to name a few. And I have to say, it doesn't get much more Melbourne than uh, Brunetti's Coffee and Cannoli before takeoff. T4, though, really shows that, it, that with great execution, it's possible to deliver great value travel options and still a really high quality, and I think uniquely, a uniquely Melbourne experience for our travellers. So let's just take a moment to explore that T4 experience through the eyes of some customers. Awesome time. Oh, well, that's great, but I'm still in the car. I wasn't expecting to be there for another 20 minutes. That's all. That's <laughs> okay, Mum. Don't worry. We'll find something to do. Just text us when you're here. Do you reckon we'll find a parking spot easy enough? Yeah. And I got it nearly half price because I booked it back in June. Nice one. Out, please. Please just take off your belt, sir. Is there anything else in your pockets? Pretty good time. Oh, all right then. <laughs> Let's see if we can get something for Grandma as well, okay? Yeah. Hey, we should get something for your mum. Hey, we should do this more often. Okay then. How about Hamilton Island next? <laughs> we got this for you. Oh, thank you. Don't you both look tagged. So tell me all about it. How was it? You have to remember that that experience is all in a low-cost terminal, which is just fantastic. So while a new terminal will rightly take centre stage, there's also been plenty of work and infrastructure investment going on behind the scenes that many will never see or certainly won't be appreciated by travellers, but which nonetheless is really vital to maintaining and growing the airport. Last year, we completed a four-year, $84 million project to replace more than seven hectares of 45-year-old concrete pavement on our airfield. To help you get the scale of this endeavour, and to put it into a, a football term, that's the equivalent of five MCG playing fields. And we're not talking here about your garden variety little three-inch uh, driveway level concrete here. We're talking about the really big aircraft-worthy stuff. 
The fact that this was done with no safety incidents while our airline customers continue to operate around this work was amazing. We also made major investment in, the, in a new integrated airport operation and coordination centre, which opened in June, and is helping to manage all of this movement of people, planes and products around our precinct. This new state-of-the-art facility can operate as a command centre in the, in the need of a crisis and embodies very impressive technology, including connection to hundreds and hundreds of CCTV cameras uh, throughout the airport precinct so we can keep across exactly what's going on there. The freight story that I mentioned earlier is not just one of growth, but also of an ever-changing landscape driven by customer demands both here and overseas. Our geographic location and the land bank we have that I talked about earlier has allowed us to play a much bigger role in the total logistics network for the entire Melbourne precinct. And we're not just talking air freight here, we're talking freight more broadly. It was that changing com consumer preference that drove the development of two of the biggest freight sorting and distribution centres in Australia. They together have a combined roof area that could cover more than four MCGs. Again, just a massive precinct and a massive facility. Toll and TNT have made huge investments in these facilities in our business park, and we really welcome having them as, uh, as partners to the airport. The capacity of our internal ground transport network is also critical and crucial to the efficient operation of the airport as a whole. The year-old airport drive has made it a lot easier for people travelling in from the west to our airport, as well as providing great access for that logistics precinct that we talked about. Our new ground transport hub at T4, which has a dedicated pick-up and drop-off area, taxi rank, bus interchange, as well as the at-terminal T4 car park, is, really, or is already making just a huge difference to the traffic flows around the airport. It certainly has reduced the backlog of vehicles that we've seen queuing up down the Tullamarine Freeway during peak times. And since it's open, we've seen an almost 10% reduction in the traffic across the, the broad forecourt area, which spans terminals one, two, and three. So a real decompression there. Now, while the projects that I've just talked about make up the majority or, or the bulk of our total $250 million spend this year on infrastructure, there are also many smaller projects that have added real value. The recent automation of the process for obtaining the Australian Security Identification Card, or ASICS, to those of us in the know and in the game, um, has taken a process that used to take something like 140 minutes of labour and more than three visits to the ASIC office per application down to only 25 minutes and one visit. Now, it's an Australian first and it has the all-important sign-off and endorsement by the Commonwealth Office of Transport Security. But you can imagine the kind of difference that sort of efficiency brings to the more than 16,000 people who work at Melbourne Airport, most of whom need one of these ASIC cards. Now, our ability to fund infrastructure investments that I've just talked about relies not only on demonstrating the value of these investments to uh, our airline customers, but also the support of our own investors who want stable returns. So therefore, I'm really pleased to report strong revenue growth of 11% for the year, which resulted in a net profit after tax slightly over $267 million. And yes, before you wonder, uh, we do pay our fair share of tax uh, to the corporate, uh, corporate tax to the public purse. The 18% increase in our expenses to just under $240 million reflects a number of extraordinary or one-off factors, including the opening and operation of the Terminal 4 and Ground Transport Hub, which required operational investment before commissioning. I think our strong financial performance is just a testament to the success of everybody in this room, from our airline customers to our other partners who operate their businesses at the airport, to the millions of travellers who access our services and use them, to the appeal and the strength of our state and the extraordinary team operating the airport. When we judge our success, we don't just think of it in terms of investment and returns though. The environment in which we operate 
also has the ability to impact on the interest of all airport stakeholders. So we do take an active interest in understanding our performance in that environment. We have a symbiotic relationship really with the communities in which we operate. More than two thirds of all people working at the airport come from the seven local councils that sit around our facility. We're also committed to supporting communities in and around the airport in other ways and we're incredibly proud of our partnerships with Western Chances, the Banksia Garden Community Centre in Broadmeadows and of course the Salvation Army who have a presence at the airport. And from providing scholarships to talented students to after school education programs to supporting victims of family violence, these organisations just do an extraordinary job and we are delighted to have continued our work with them again this year. As balancing the needs of all stakeholders is critical to us, we do undertake research on an annual basis to see if we're actually getting that balance right. And this year we surveyed more than 2,000 travellers, neighbours and people from the wider Victorian community and a hefty number of those of you sitting in this room tonight to, to get your views. Now this is where I'd love to say, and the survey says, my little Grant Denyer moment, but we'll perhaps park that. But what we did discover through this survey was that there was universal support for the ongoing development of the airport to meet the demands of future growth. Nobody wants us to hold back. You'll be pleased to see, or you were pleased to see, the improvement in the passenger experience, certainly with the opening of the new domestic terminal. But you are telling us, you're looking to us now for the next generation of infrastructure upgrades. We'll certainly be giving you a sneak peek, sneak peek of our plans uh, in that regard tonight. While our community engagement activities are well regarded by our stakeholders, they are definitely chomping at the bit to know more about issues such as the rail link project to the city, as well as our development of our third runway. And you're going to hear from Laurie and Simon on those issues in just a moment. Our key stakeholders have welcomed renewed focus on the customer airlines and they've certainly seen us making real commitment to being partners in the success of their business and that's coming through. So in what has been a period of great change, then I'm really pleased to report that the overall reputation score for the last year was 80.9. And importantly, that reflects a 5% increase on the performance the year before. It's terrific. But we certainly don't take those results for granted. At their core, they reflect the quality of the relationships we have with many of you in this room tonight. And we are definitely grateful for those relationships and we know they require ongoing commitment, effort and nurturing. So as you can see from those results in the round, it's been a very good year. There have been some significant achievements. We've certainly built a strong foundation to build on, but as, as I said at the outset, we aspire to do better. When you look at Melbourne, the city, you, you can really see quite easily why so many people choose to live or visit here. Consistently ranked in the top most livable cities in the world, it really is easy to see why. Sometimes you need to take yourself out of the Melbourne environment and come back to just appreciate how good it is. Now contrast that to the airport. The airport's good. We do some things really well, but it's not quite great. And there are a number of attributes that Melbourne has that you just don't see reflected in the airport, which is odd and, and, and a shame. So we as a team have set ourselves an ambition. We want to be an airport Melbourne can be proud of. An airport that really adds value and strength to the appeal of the city and the state in which we operate. We want all stakeholders to feel this pride with us and that means delivering an airport experience that our customer airlines are proud to share with their passengers. It means growing the airport asset in a way that makes our shareholders proud of their investment. We want our community, from our neighbours to every Victorian, to feel pride in this reflection of this great state. And importantly, we want our people to feel proud to come to work every day. Now this, this ambition of engendering pride in all we do will be seen as a guiding hand in the things we're up to as we move forward. To be an airport Melbourne can be proud of though, there are a few things we're going to need to get right. And when I say we, I actually do mean most of us in this room as key stakeholders in the airport. We're going to need to deliver the right infrastructure 
at the right time, but of course at the right price which is acceptable to our customers and their travellers. And timing is critical when it comes to infrastructure, as we all know, and the scale that we deal with. You know, if you make your investments too late, then we risk constraining capacity, and that has a big impact on the state. But if you make investments too early, it can be terribly wasteful and put unnecessary pressure on our customers and their travellers. So while we're going to be making these sound investment decisions on airport infrastructure, as David said, we're going to take every opportunity to improve the traveller experience because we know it's that positive first and last experience that, en that encourages people to return, to send their children to a university here or to establish a business here. And that means working together to deliver an end-to-end -end journey that really adds to, not in any way detracts from that world-class Melbourne experience. To be successful, we also need to do our bit as a key member of Team Victoria. Now, Team Victoria, as, as many of us know, bring together an array of individuals and organisations, all with a common purpose or common goal to attract people and economic benefit to this state. And that means working together to attract new airline customers and perhaps more importantly, supporting those airlines who already operate here to continue to have success and growth. It also means working together to protect one of Victoria's great competitive advantages, and that is our curfew-free 24-hour airport operation. Success will also rely in the coming years on getting the interface between the airport and the rest of the state right, ensuring that we have growth capacity across every element of the journey and no constraints. That means working together to ensure that we've got enough headroom in our international access agreements to accommodate aviation growth between target markets. But it also means encouraging investment in ground and mass transport uh, access, I should say, between the airport and the city. We can't let that be a bottleneck. Perhaps most importantly of all to me, our success rests in the hands of our team. And it is possible for some businesses to be ordinary and still deliver reasonable results. But as I've said, we don't want to be ordinary. Like our city and like our state, we want to be great. And therefore, we need to perform as a high performance team. And that means we're going to need to invest in our own capabilities, our own systems, best in breed practices, streamlining all the things we do, and of course, investing in our people and their development. That ambition of being an airport Melbourne can be proud of is not just a one-time effort or aspiration. It's something that we're going to have to be in for the long term. This is an incredibly exciting time, and I feel we're off to a good start. And, I, and I'm sure from what we talk about tonight, you'll see why I feel very privileged to hold this post. One year down, and with your support, quite a few good years ahead. So that's enough from me. I'm now going to hand over to members of our leadership team to discuss their priorities for the future, starting with, as a leader of our aviation team, uh, Simon Gandhi. Simon, over to you. Thanks, Lyle, and um, good evening, everyone. Um, as Lyle has highlighted, over the past 12 months, we've built some really great foundations that will stand us in good stead for the next phase of our journey together. And to say this is going to be exciting doesn't quite hit the mark. I'm especially proud of our beautiful new Terminal 4, which you saw earlier in the video. And if you're one of the 7 million travellers who've already passed through, I'm sure you'd agree with me that it's even more impressive in person. Our airport is the gateway to our city and our state, the ultimate destination of our passengers. However, first and last impressions are important, and we want to create a positive experience for all our visitors traveling through the airport. We will do this by improving what we do today and continuing to plan and build the facilities that we need for our future. The challenges we face in our international rivals will be well known to many of you. It is an issue which requires a team effort and we work closely with our border agencies to improve the passenger experience and the processing times. 
However, the federal government needs to ensure our border agencies have the right resources to do their job and meet strong forecast growth in international travellers to Melbourne. And we're very pleased to see the recent announcements regarding their seamless traveller program. Technology will play an important part in this program, particularly for the visitor experience, but also for, their, for delivering efficiencies for the agencies. But we must find ways to speed up the implementation of these border force solutions. We're continuing to deliver on our responsibility to provide safe, secure and efficient terminal infrastructure at the right time, as Lyle has said. And our investment pipeline is not getting any smaller. In the short term, we'll be improving the international arrivals area, introducing an eighth baggage carousel to speed up baggage collection. We're also expanding the arrivals hall, providing a more inviting space for family and friends to welcome arriving travellers. Now, while these renders give you a great sense of what I'm talking about, I encourage you all to try the virtual reality goggles that we have on display following tonight's presentation. Everyone loves a gadget, by the way. And they'll bring this exciting new development to life. Melbourne has grown faster than any other Australian airport, and this is no accident. Our success at securing international services and ensuring those services are sustainable over the medium and long term has been a team effort. And that's where Team Victoria really plays such an important role in driving and growing the demand for our destination. The other East Coast airports have woken up to this approach. And make no mistake, we are in competition. But our focus remains on being agile and innovative, building on the relationships that we have with our trade, investment and education colleagues, working hard to find new ways to build market interest in our destination and in overseas routes, effectively helping to fill the aircraft. Most of us in this room would know that the curfew-free operation of our airport is a key competitive advantage for Victoria. The ability to fly high-value produce to key uh, trading partners overnight in time for market the following day makes Victoria a nation leader. The scheduling flexibility it provides also makes Victoria a standout, not only to prospective airlines, but also for the organisers of major events and conferences. But our 24-7 operation is not something we can take for granted. It requires the ongoing efforts of the airport, airlines, all levels of government, and the support of our local communities to sustain. And it requires us all to make sensible on and off airport planning decisions now and into the future, as we ensure the long-term benefit of the state as a whole and build an airport that Melbourne can be proud of. In the next five years, we will be developing our airport to accommodate the growth of more than one million additional passengers a year. In developing our plans, we have been working hard to understand the needs of our customers and stakeholders. And this has helped us to shape plans that ensure we will be making the right investment choices at the right time to support the growth in passengers and freight, plans that will upgrade our existing facilities and take the opportunity to improve the passenger experience wherever we can, and plans that assure the future of our airport through to 2023, by which time we will be managing in excess of 40 million passengers every year. These plans include new security facilities to handle passengers faster and more efficiently without compromising the quality of our security. Greater automation of our international check-in area to align with the successful rollout in our domestic terminals. Additional departure gates and improved departure experiences, which Andrew will share a little bit more about with you shortly. And additional arrivals reclaims area and working with our agency colleagues for improved border processes. Now, looking to the longer term, we're already undertaking detailed work on what will be the single lar largest infrastructure project in the airport's history, our runway development program. 
realizing the great legacy that Melbourne's planners envisaged back in the late 60s. The third runway has been a feature of our plans for over 27 years. And over the next few years, we will be converting those plans into reality, extending our existing east-west runway and building a new parallel east-west runway will help to meet demand over the coming decades. Getting the timing right on such a significant project will be crucial. And we're talking in detail with our airline customers, government and community stakeholders about the importance of the project, how we're going to deliver it, and what measures we may need to put in place to manage the growing peaks in the meantime. Long-term planning is a critical part of what we do. We take our role as a custodian of the airport seriously, which means that we're committed to safeguarding the ultimate growth potential of the state for future generations. Now, I'm in my 10th year of living and working in this great city, our city, my city, and I'm really excited to be leading our aviation business to make Melbourne an airport we can all be proud of. Now, I'd like to hand over to Andrew Gardner, our Chief of Retail, to continue our story. Thank you. Thanks, Simon, and hello, everyone. Customers are the lifeblood of a business. The work that Simon and his team do to support our airlines and grow our passenger numbers is important for a lot of reasons, not least of all, for our airport retailers. Our challenge in the retail business is to enhance the traveler journey by offering a variety of retail and food and beverage experiences that contribute to our mission, to create an airport that Melbourne can be proud of. Retail is a rapidly growing and increasingly sophisticated feature of the modern airport. That's true both here in Australia and internationally. It also, help, it also plays a big role in shaping perceptions about the destination. Our great city is world-renowned for its shopping, food and beverage, and cultural experiences. We are the fashion capital of Australia, and we want our airport to mirror our city. We want more of those attributes to be front of mind for passengers when they travel through the airport. As soon as our customers step off the plane or before they leave, we want them to experience the best that Melbourne has to offer. First and last impressions are often those that remain. Maybe it's a quick coffee on the run or browsing the latest fashions from well-known brands. Perhaps a luxury item purchase or sitting down to a meal prepared by one of Melbourne's iconic chefs. We are fortunate to have Shannon Bennett, Frank Camora, and Brunetti's and Gelli brothers leading the field. The standard of retail at all major airports in Australia is improving, and we are no different. We are working on some exciting projects which will take the retail experience at Melbourne Airport to a whole new level. In particular, we started a major refurbishment of the retail area in the international terminal, which will be up there with the best in the world. This new space will capture the character of Melbourne, and not in a token way, but in a way that truly showcases the sophisticated and varied essence of Melbourne. There will be a strong focus on the luxury brands keenly sought by many of our international visitors, especially from our growing Chinese market. Our extensive research has highlighted the quality of brands our diverse customers desire, including authentic luxury goods with strong brand recognition. Just as visitors head for the luxury boutiques along Collins Street and the CBD, we want to offer them a similar shopping experience here at the airport. We're also enhancing a duty-free offering as part of this upgrade. Our new duty-free area will be completed in the second quarter of 2017. By the middle of next year, we will have created a new dining experience in T2 with leading Melbourne restaurants and providors offering our departing passengers an experience to remember and encourage them to speak fondly of their trip and their experience. 
Our laneway, luxury stores and hospitality area will be open by the end of 2017. I look forward to working with all our retail partners, many of whom present here this evening, to deliver a thing of beauty and an experience which will enthrall and excite our customers and make us proud of Melbourne Airport. But first, our customers have to get to the airport. So let me introduce Laurie Argus, Chief of Parking and Ground Transport, to take you through what's happening in that part of the business. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I'm a great contributor to the retail profitability at Melbourne Airport. Um, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm very, it's a fantastic night, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. So, ground transportation connections between the airport and Melbourne at City, as well as Victoria, is a vital part of our longer-term growth. A traveler's journey, both to the airport and from it, helps shape their perception of their ultimate destination. That perception impacts on all of our customers. We've made some really great progress this year, and we have some exciting initiatives coming up and planned for the future to make the travel between the airport and the city easier. Now, some people might say that getting there is half the fun, but for anybody who works at the airport like me, going down the Telemarine Freeway right now, I'm sure that some of our guests and passengers don't feel that way. So there is much to do and much to improve in our transit experience. We are striving to make the trip to and from the airport as seamless and stress-free as possible. And a big part of that trip is the airport parking experience. I moved to Melbourne just over a year ago. If you'd like to jump into my shoes for a minute, think about as I'm meeting people out, making friends, going to barbecues, and people ask what I do, and I tell them I'm in charge of parking at Melbourne Airport. The very first question, without fail, is are you also in charge of the pricing of the parking at Melbourne Airport? Which I politely say, why, yes, I am. And then I get a little bit of feedback. And then I often wonder why I'm never invited back. But on a serious note, there's lots of challenges to tackle that perception. And we're working really hard at changing that perception. The reality is value is a very individual perception. And we understand that, which is why we offer products that are designed to meet the needs of all of our customers. We have low-cost options, value stay, premium, and valet, and they're competitively priced within their segments. The challenge for us is helping our customers understand what's the right option for them. So tonight, I'm really thrilled and delighted to share with you that we're only days away from launching a very exciting new marketing campaign that's going to build on those insights, and it's parking to be proud of. Some customers are driven by price, and they don't mind taking a little bit longer to get to the terminals. Some will want to be as close to their parking gate as possible, their boarding gate as possible. And others still will want to just hand over their keys and keep going because they don't want to park their car themselves. They're interested in their Bernetti's coffee before their trip. So we're passionate about making the right options and, and ensuring that we have the suitable options for our customers. One of the most important factors in airport parking is the convenience of parking at our terminals. This is an area that we know we can do better. I also get lots of feedback about that as well. In particular, I'm excited to announce that we are doing a lot in the space of wayfinding and improving and introducing new digital wayfinding into our car parking. This will make it easier and less time consuming for our customers and drivers to find the right parking spot as quickly as possible. In the medium term, we are making improvements on the airport site and there are a number of projects underway outside of the airport. The CityLink Telemarine Freeway upgrade is well underway, and thank you to Transurban and the Victorian and Commonwealth governments for their contributions. The airport end of that project is scheduled to be completed by 2018, and we know you will enjoy a quicker trip to the airport because we will have an extra lane in both directions. Other transport modes, such as buses, taxis, hire cars, car rentals, are also supporting our operations. We had almost 2.2 million taxi movements last year in our taxi ranks, and that's a 4% increase on the year before. We have significantly invested in our taxi industry through improved access, better amenities, and expanded holding areas. At last count, we could accommodate over 800 taxis in our holding areas, which ensures a ready available stream of vehicles for our arriving passengers. A next stage of our taxi strategy is to ensure we are introducing a new automated taxi management system, which is going to make life easier for the taxi drivers 
to operate in and out of our terminals with removing any manual processes. This is a significant step forward for us and our taxi industry and association, which will enable drivers to provide even better services to our arriving travellers. In addition to our parking on-site options, our convenient taxi options in the terminals, there are also 17 off-airport parking providers and other shuttle bus services that we need to accommodate for in, as you can imagine, a very busy forecourt. With over 100,000 movements a day at the airport, these figures highlight the growing demand and the range of ground transport providers for access into our constrained forecourt and the importance of managing that access fairly and equitably to accommodate the variety of demands placed upon it each day. In the medium term, we will be looking at ways to improve the traffic flows in the forecourt, whether that's through infrastructure or technology solutions. And in the long longer term, as Lyle touched on, we are focused on contributing to the discussion around mass transit and how we will best manage the doubling of movements over the coming decades. So as Simon mentioned earlier, 40 million passengers by 2023. I often sit in my office and wonder where they're going to go. But clearly, we need a mass transit solution. Rail looks like a sensible option. It has certainly been part of our master planning to date. But given the long lead times and the high cost of heavy rail, planners have to really think about more creatively what's the best rail solution for us and what might suit our market to give an airport link the best chance of success at Melbourne Airport. What we do know is whatever the solution, it will need to be frequent, it will need to be reliable, it will need to be quick, and it will need to be competitively priced, and all of that plus delivered in the next 10 to 15 years to cope with demand. Our growth always presents challenges when it comes to airport access, but as the other business units have spoken about tonight, we are very focused on delivering the right investments at the right time. That includes both physical infrastructure and new technology to get the best results for our customers. We really look forward to working with all of you on those challenges and the opportunities in the future. And as you travel in and out of the airport, you'll also see a lot of commercial activity happening in our property portfolio, which is a great segue for me to introduce our chief of property, Link Horton, to the stage to talk to you about those opportunities. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Good evening, everyone. Now, some of you will be surprised that the airport even has a property team. What could we possibly do at an international airport such as Melbourne? Well, the answer lies in something Lyle mentioned earlier, our substantial land bank. Melbourne Airport actually occupies over 2,400 hectares. That's almost four times the size of Melbourne's CBD huddle grid. You could literally tuck away both the MCG and Etihad Stadium into a single corner of our property. How do I know this? Well, we did it. Literally, we relocated Essen Football Club to the airport from Windy Hill. Our land bank is a significant piece of real estate. It provides us with a great opportunity to grow, both in terms of aviation and commercially. Clearly, Melbourne Airport is a tremendous asset, not just for us, but for all Victorians. Our challenge is to develop the estate in ways that deliver value for all our stakeholders. Now, I appreciate this sounds like a very grand statement, but it's one we actually take extremely seriously. And I'll give you an example. I mentioned it earlier, but last year, we completed two substantial industrial warehouse developments in our business park for Toll IPEC and TNT. It's obvious to see how such developments added value to our business. But what benefits do we provide for others? Well, one of our greatest benefits we can provide to tenants such as Toll and TNT is that we have the flexibility to accommodate their growth over the longer term. And with these new businesses come even more job opportunities for our local community. We didn't achieve this on our own. In this example, we were strongly supported by the economic development team at Hume City Council, who worked with us to encourage and then assist both Toll and TNT in their move to the airport. That's a great, great team effort and really highlights Lyle's earlier point that when we can get the right balance of stakeholder needs, we'll all succeed together. So here's a challenge from me to all of you. How can you work with us 
and we work with you and your organizations to develop even more of that land bank. To get you thinking, here are some of the plans we already have underway. Logistics warehousing. The Melbourne Airport Business Park is our largest commercial precinct at circa 350 hectares. It's home to some of the state's largest distribution centers, as you saw, but we still have some 160 hectares available for further development. Or there's cargo and freight. Our Melbourne Airport cargo estate is becoming home to an airport business community involved in that rapidly expanding movement of air freight you heard from earlier. Or commercial. Our gallery park and square precincts are focused on higher density commercial uses, such as offices and hotels, which aim to serve that terminal community. And I mentioned before that we have enough room for several football grounds, but we have a focus on leisure development in our gateway precinct, which is located along the Tullamarine Freeway. That area is currently home to the Eston Football Club, and we're very excited about the opportunities to develop this precinct further with greater leisure activities. But I'll come to more on that in a minute. Clearly, there's a wealth of development opportunities just waiting to be unlocked. For us, our main immediate focus is industrial warehousing. Being located in the northwest of Melbourne and directly connected to the state freeway network, it's what a lot of our land is best suited for. However, it's not the only thing we're doing, and there are a number of exciting developments underway which help to highlight the potential of our estate. In our terminals, we are completing a new airline lounge for Air New Zealand. And in that cargo state, we have recently completed a 10,000 square meter warehouse for Alpha Flight Catering, which is now in the process of being fitted out as their largest flight catering facility in Australia. But in addition to our own developments, we are supporting key stakeholders with their on-airport developments. The Little Group has transformed a maintenance base at the southern end of our airfield into a commercial aviation hub supporting the airline community. What is now referred to as the Melbourne Aviation Precinct is about to be further transformed with the development of a corporate jet base, providing Australia with its first purpose-built, world-class facility for private jets, a magnificent gateway into Melbourne for VIP travelers. Now, as much as I may aspire to be a customer of theirs, I think I have a much better chance of being a customer at another exciting development happening in our gateway precinct, Urban Surf. Urban Surf is Australia's first surf park featuring an outdoor lagoon that generates perfect surf waves and a safe and controlled environment. As one of Australia's most popular pastimes, we expect Urban Surf to be a major draw card when it opens early in 2018. Now, over the next few years, we have plans for additional developments such as a new petrol precinct along Airport Drive and the expansion of our hotel offering. Not surprisingly, as our airport grows, so does the need for additional hotel rooms. The completion of the new Terminal 4 provides us with that opportunity to develop a new mid-tier hotel that can directly service these customers. The initial market discussions we've had have been positive and our aim is to develop the hotel in such a way that it provides the traveling public with the services they're seeking. At the same time, it complements the surrounding commercial precinct and in some way reflects Melbourne's unique identity. Over the long term, we'll continue to grow our commercial precincts, adding industrial warehousing, offices and hotels. But we'll need to be mindful of the needs of Melbourne's Northwest as it continues along its significant growth path. And we'll have to react to the market conditions as it changes. It's very exciting. We have a great opportunity with the land in the Melbourne Airport Land Bank. And in developing our property portfolio, we are committed to continuing to play our role in supporting Melbourne's growth, as well as the broader Victorian market, with an airport Melbourne and all of our stakeholders can be proud of. I'd now like to hand you back over to our CEO, Lyle Sternby. Thank you. Thanks, Link. Um, I bet you never thought that Link was our resident uh, beach boy, did you? It's uh, pretty amazing. 
Um, and I just want to thank uh, my other uh, key leaders in the business for, for their part in, in tonight's presentation, to, to Simon, to Laurie, uh, to Andrew as well. I, I think what that gives you is a, is a bit of a sense of the talent that we have, and it's only a glimmer of the talent that we actually have across the business. I also hope that that's given you a bit of an insight about what lies ahead for Melbourne Airport in the coming year. And I really hope that you feel the enthusiasm that we all feel and demonstrate, I think, tonight uh, in playing our part in Victoria and Melbourne's future success. I'll conclude by saying just a couple of things. In that if we are successful in our ambition to make Melbourne Airport an airport Melbourne can be proud of, then you're going to see a few things. You're going to see an airport that is committed to service excellence for its customers and their passengers. A disciplined airport that is efficient and growing and supported by the right investment at the right time. An airport where all of our airlines and all of our business partners are able to operate their businesses successfully too. An airport that is seamlessly connected to its community, and whether that be through physical ground transport or strong stakeholder engagement and relationships and an airport that is clearly part of the economic and social fabric of this great state of ours, and is protected and promoted through such government planning and policy decisions that we need because we all recognise just what a wonderful competitive advantage this airport delivers to the state. And finally, I hope you will see on an ongoing basis an airport that is led by a team that doesn't just settle for good results, but aspires to be great year after year. I look forward to continuing this journey with all of you. And again, I really want to thank you for making time to be with us here tonight. And I hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you very, very much.